Hello. So, so these things are recorded, and this is referring to our blog also. Good. So the audience has to be, you know, for the um, for, for the blog site. Okay. Um, so um, this is uh, the first or, uh, occasion we have to work with the Russian club at NYU. Um, and uh, we'll see, uh, I know that the Russian club also do, covers a variety of things, including culture, for the most part, but there's also an interest in policy and public policy. Um, and we'll be hearing, we'll be talking more about how we can about these things in the future. Um, the reason why the Russian club was interested in this occasion to work with the Jordan Center was that, um, um, well, for a variety of reasons. One of them is to, um, you know, your program, I think, should concern undergraduates in particular mm -hmm. at NYU. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one was that NYU has a weakness when it comes to questions of public policy. Um, and uh, we're beginning to, t to tinker now with existing programs to try to make them more policy oriented. So I personally have a, an intellectual interest and a professional interest mm -hmm. to see how we might be modeling things in the future. But also to tell our students that there is such a program somewhere else and they should take an interest and uh, to spread the word. Um, Robin Lewis, um, I don't know how to begin to describe you. Um, <laughs> Neither do I, believe yeah. um, um, I, um, So Robin Lewis is a native of Greenwich Village, actually. Um, <laughs> and he's since become a citizen of the world. <laughs> and he's, um, he grew up on Waverly, I gather. Right? Washington Place. Actually. Washington Place, yes. right. And um, um, so he's a graduate of Columbia University, um, uh, in mainly in the humanities and social sciences. Um, and went on from there to do all sorts of things related to, um, well, university administration, uh, but also uh, global education and global programming. Uh, he has a joint appointment right now between, if I have this right, and Beijing, is that right? Beijing Normal University. Beijing Normal University, okay. And at the same time, he's, he manages things which are trans national, I guess, it's sort of conglomerates of universities, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. which, um, w uh, which run global um, uh, global programs. Right? Mm -hmm. So NYU is very much involved in global movements and in global, yes, global affairs. But I think your take is different, which is that you uh, combine several universities and several programs at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if we could hear from you more about how you structure the program at, at ANEPA in particular. Sure. Um, at ANEPA, for those of you who don't know, is the, is the result of the merger of different institutions in Russia, which were very good, correct me as soon as I'm wrong, at um, training um, administrators, uh, which is the people who have well-rounded educations and have, um, and then go on to take on leading positions in the administration, um, but also um, in business. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Danepa trains a goodly portion of the MBAs in Russia. 40%. 40%. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a very large number of people who work in high-level and mid-level positions in Russian administration are also graduates of Danepa or its predecessors. Am, am I right about that? Absolutely. Right. The closest uh, model I could find would be something like the Emma in, uh, in, in France. Yeah. Something along those or a bit of Emma and Sciences Po together, together. Which, is, which is not comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, the reality of uh, public policy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us more about it. I will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russian Club. It's good to see you. Um, and um, I'll, I'll begin by contextualizing myself, which will be one way of um, clarifying what follows. Um, as I mentioned, I, um, I actually spent most of my career at Columbia, where I was uh, the Associate Dean of SIPA, the School of International Public Affairs, which is Columbia's public policy graduate school. Uh, it's a school that started as an international affairs school and became a more broadly based public policy school beginning in 1977 when it added an MPA program. Here at NYU, you have the Wagner School, which is a very good public policy school indeed. Um, so, uh, but but the the period when I was at Columbia and the professor indeed we intersected uh, in the late 80s and early 90s was a period when, uh, as at so many other universities, the student body and to a certain extent also the faculty was globalizing, was internationalizing. So, it was the sense that. Um, looking to the future that universities as a whole, but particularly programs that had global content, needed to have students and faculty from around the world. Uh, so that was a process that was very much ongoing. Um, the uh, MPA program, when I came in the mid-80s, like the MPA program out here at the Wagner School at that time, um, 
was very American focused. It produced students who went to jobs in government, in three governments, the federal government, the New York State government, and the New York City government. End of story. 95% Americans, 5% international students. And then in the late 80s, a number of countries began sending, particularly Mexico, uh, Taiwan, China, Korea, started, South Korea started sending uh, young government servants, people a few years into the service, out for training. And they, they started, oh, I'm sorry, they started, a, a, I'm not even sure how to get this quiet, there we go. Um, uh, they started uh, uh, asking the, the very good question, why are all the case studies we're looking at American? Why are they so US centric? And what happened was that um, the, the, as the constituency began to change, the way of teaching public policy began to change, and, and people began to think globally for the first time, and to look at comparative best practices rather than purely American ones. So that's a process that a lot of schools went through. At the same time, on the, more on the international affairs side, um, the student body at SIPA at Columbia was also, and same process here, many other universities in the United States and, and in Europe were, were getting more and more international students. So um, this was a, a, a change that was beginning to happen. And then, particularly in, in fields having to do, again, with global issues, what began to evolve um, was that um, programs in public policy began to appear elsewhere. Uh, first, more in Europe, where it really wasn't a field. Because I should explain, in the US, public policy programs grew out of a larger, older, more limited field that was generally tagged as public administration. And you had public administration programs at lots of American universities, particularly at the flagship state level, so the University of Georgia, the state universities, all of them, sorry. Would you, this, is, this is Sky, which he's lost, no doubt. Yeah. Um, the, uh, um, and the, these were places that trained people for state government and local government. Uh, so it was, a, it was a purely American enterprise throughout. It really comes out of the post-war 50s and 60s uh, and 70s, but then began to become something quite different. So um, the, the evolution of what we now call global public policy is something that really began, as so many other things global did in the late 80s, the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the crumbling of the Soviet Union were relevant events, but um, what was also happening in other parts of the world, in Asia, in places like Singapore, uh, was that, and, and in Europe, where you had very rigid, old-fashioned academic institutions in countries like France and Germany, and, and to, to a lesser extent in the UK, is again, they started fostering interdisciplinary programs of the kind that public policy uh, uh, is. So public policy is a field that is uh, inherently interdisciplinary. It draws uh, faculty from uh, disciplinary departments such as political science, economics, history, sociology, anthropology, management as well, um, and, and, and often integrates the study of language into that process so that students can develop their expertise in a particular area if they're interested in area studies. It, at Columbia and, and at NYU, again, you have regional centers like the Jordan Center that enable people to go more deeply into one region or another and to integrate that with their disciplinary studies. But um, public policy as a field today, I think, has, is coming of age. And global public policy is really a field that is attracting more and more students worldwide. And it's a student body that's very mobile, that's moving around. We were talking earlier about this phenomenon that uh, more and more uh, students from America and Western Europe, but also from Asia and, and indeed Africa and Latin America and other places, um, are feeling that they need to globalize themselves, that they need to move from uh, perhaps the traditional path, which would be to do an undergraduate degree in their country and stay in that country and do a graduate degree. They want to have a broader credential. Um, I met a couple of years ago a, a student who was majoring in Chinese and Chinese studies at Harvard and she was interested in coming to study in China, and she said, you know, I have a Harvard degree. I don't need another one. I don't need a Columbia degree or a Princeton degree for my graduate degree. I need a Chinese degree. I need to, because I want to work in China, something related to China, or at least initially I want to have a credential that shows that I understand what's going on in China. So I'm looking for a Chinese graduate program. And that's increasingly the pattern. 
Um, China is a little bit ahead of Russia in this, I think, in terms of recruiting international faculty, recruiting international students, has been doing that for a while. Um, and uh, in a, a comparable but somewhat different master's program that I teach in in Beijing, which is called in the, what's called the School of Social Development and Public Policy. So it's a little less politics oriented, a little bit more social policy issues like social security, health policy, social safety net, migrant workers. Um, we now have students in the third year of the, of the operation of this, again, two-year English language master's degree. We now have students from uh, over 20 countries, and they're from everywhere. They're from Africa, they're from the US, they're from Brazil, they're from uh, Germany and the UK, and from China as well. So this is uh, the direction in which things are going. Now, Russia, in the process of globalizing both its faculties and its student bodies, has really uh, been uh, a bit of a laggard particularly if you look at places like Brazil and China, um, maybe India less so. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, and you're all of you interested in studying Russia and experts on Russia, and we might speculate on why that is. I mean, I think like other great empires and great countries like the US, like China, like the Brits, um, uh, Russia had its own brand of exceptionalism, and that led to a kind of isolation and sense of self-sufficiency that uh, worked against Russia reaching out to the rest of the world. Now, this changed in the Soviet era, and someone has made the comment that uh, the, the, the internationalization impulse is really was a Soviet project, as they put it. Um, but in the, 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 the period after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think um, Russia turned deeply, although temporarily, inward, and was looking uh, largely at its own at the texture of its own society, its economy, and obviously at the enormous rearrangement of resources and structures that was going on there in a, in a very chaotic way, and as we know, in a, a way that was not uh, enormously successful initially. And it's only now that Russia is kind of finding its feet. And part of that process is Russia, for the first time, and particularly at the government levels, at the policy levels, wanting to be a voice and a positive voice and a respected voice in international councils discussing pressing global public policy issues. So that uh, it's, it's in the last three, four years and the year coming, you have Russia chairing APEC, the uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group. You have them chairing uh, G20. Uh, next year you have them chairing G8. You have them presenting the Olympics. Uh, and suddenly Russia is uh, assuming a leadership role uh, in global policy and collaborative circles. Um, it's a good thing, I think, for Russia. I think uh, people across the political spectrum and from different points of view and for different reasons in Russia think it's a good idea. So that the government has begun to put a lot of resources into uh, improving Russia's presence in this field. I mean, in general, there's a lot of resources going into higher education. Now, that's a a subset of what I'm going to talk about, but I can't pass that by so quickly. As you know, in many countries, um, the, the, the push has been to um, project each country's universities into the global rankings, create the so-called world-class university. It's a very elusive process. Um, rankings are something that most academics, myself included, don't like. Um, uh, but um, the ranking systems, the, the, from the U.S. News and World Reports to the uh, Times, Times London Educational Supplement, QS, and, and now there's a big one that uh, comes out of Shanghai, Jiao Tong, um, have acted as a spur to ministries of education across the world to try and raise the status of their universities in those rankings, and Russia is no stranger to that. So there are some positive effects which mean resources flowing into higher education, uh, there are also some negative effects, which are, uh, which are considerable, which have to do with uh, ratings that are often, in fact, rather skewed and rather f what I would call fake. Um, the, the rating systems, as you probably know, are in particular of, the, of universities worldwide, are very much skewed in favor of comprehensive universities that offer the broadest range, including especially the hard sciences. Now, one of the ways they measure they, they rank universities as how many of your faculty's publications have been cited in other publications. Well, if you have a big science faculty 
because the tradition in scientific writing is very heavy on citations, your university comes out way ahead of a place that has few or little or no scientists. So specialized, often very excellent institutions, London School of Economics, Sciences Po Paris, uh, Renepa, uh, Higher School of Economics for that matter, which is one of the top Russian schools, are a disadvantage because they're not comprehensive, they're specialized. Um, um, so the ranking system is, uh, is, in my mind, you know, something that has, although it's had some positive effects in terms of resources, is something that's a little bit elusive. Um, that said, um, governments like those in Chinese, China and Russia have made a big effort to uh, identify top institutions that are perhaps viable candidates for moving up into the top 100 or top 250 or whatever. Uh, and, and have begun to put resources into specially identified universities. In China, there's a group of 35 uh, that receive money through a, a, a plan that's called 985. It's uh, 985, actually, May 1998, which is when it was started, and um, privileges the, those 35 universities and gives them additional funds to enhance their faculty, to raise the quality of their research, uh, to get more students and so forth. Uh, and Russia also has identified uh, a small group of universities, there's uh, federal universities, and then there's a small group of universities, largely in Moscow, that also uh, are being supported, including including uh, the Renato, or Russian Presidential Academy. Uh, Higher School of Economics is another one, then there's the Foreign Ministry School called NGIMO, the at Moscow State International Affairs Institute, which was my first partner when I began working in Russia in 1988. Um, so, Russia is joining uh, the bandwagon, as it were, but also is at the same time in a, in a substantive way figuring out the, its identity in global, in the, what I would call the global public policy dialogue. Now, along with this comes an awareness, which is not just happening in Russia, which is that the most, a lot of the most pressing issues that countries face are issues that cannot be solved at the nation state level, that can only be solved by cross-national, transnational collaboration. Um, the obvious ones have to do with climate change and environment, with epidemics and deadly diseases, with global trade disputes, with natural disasters, uh, with international finance and banking rules. There are many of these things, and now more increasingly, uh, also something that I'll mention, which is the, 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 challenge, the demographic challenges for the global labor force, which is very acute across a broad range of nations. If you look at where the, the size of, have, how the size of the aging population is growing in the US, in Russia, in China, in Germany, across a broad range of some of the more productive economies over the last 20 years, uh, there's a huge challenge there because the proportion of the population in the workforce is shrinking rapidly, and the proportion of people at the retirement age who need and demand more resources in terms of health care and social benefits are rising exponentially. If you look particularly at China, it's just the most striking example, but today the ratio of workforce to retirees in China is something on the order of five or six to one. That is five workers per one retiree. By 2050, it's going to be three to two. So the, the implications for economic growth, which it has to be fed by a replenished ongoing workforce, are formidable. And many countries are facing the same. So there's a complex of global public policy issues that increasingly are being tackled by global networks like the ones I mentioned. Uh, G8, G20, but there's also the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and many other uh, uh, projects that, uh, and discussions that are increasingly playing a very important role. Also, I didn't even mention energy, but that's related to climate change, but uh, global energy compacts and, and moving towards some kind of consensus about how to deal with global warming. So in trying to be a voice in these councils, um, um, Russia has decided that it's a good idea to have a program that would bring together students and faculty from a range of countries, not just Russians, 
uh, but the Russian students and faculty, of course, are a very important <coughs> component of that. So that's where this project comes out of. Now, uh, Yanni gave us some sense of um, a, a bit of this, that there was a merger, although more, more of a takeover than a hmm. merger. Hostile. The, yeah, it was a hostile takeover. The Academy of National Economy was a, a strong, academically strong, economic policy institution. It was, it was and is, and the new larger is still headed by Vladimir Mao, whose picture you see here, the, the mustache next to the native. Uh, he was a very distinguished economist. Uh, he was the right hand advisor to Yegor Gaidar, who was the first prime minister, the first prime minister of Russia, and a very distinguished economist. Uh, we still have within the, the academy the Gaidar Institute, which is a top policy, economic policy institute, and the Gaidar Forum, which is a yearly kind of kind of a Davos, but not so corporate, more economic policy thinkers getting together in Moscow every January. Um, and that took over what was a large, sprawling, largely dysfunctional Russian Academy of Public Administration, which was charged with training civil servants. Now, that part of it had 65 or 66 campuses all over Russia, ranging from some very, the, the main, the flagship on, in Moscow to uh, smaller but very high level ones in St. Petersburg, in Nizhny Novgorod, in Rostov, for instance. Yekaterinburg, Novosibirsk, but then many other branches of s both smaller and of poor descending quality, including in some very small uh, 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 members of the Russian Federation in remote places of Russia, because Russia, as you know, is the biggest country in the world. And um, so there are, there are the, the, the merged RANEPA is national economy and public administration. The public administration venture is, which I'm only peripherally involved in, is moving in a, in a very positive way toward uh, upgrading the training that Russian civil servants uh, get. Now, sitting, existing, current Russian civil servants have, do have a, a, a training requirement. They have to do certain coursework every five years to replenish their skills. The problem is they've had no good access to meaningful instruction, and most of those smaller branches I'm mentioning were really functioning on the level of uh, what I would call a kind of 1950s correspondence course, where you, you, know, you send someone a book and then they send back a paper. It was a very dead kind of instruction. They're moving toward using technology and all the enormous potential that that will unlock to uh, being able to teach people at the highest level with experts in Moscow and the big cities, online, teaching online, interacting online, you know, using all the, the technology of, distance, of real modern distance learning. So that is going on. They're also doing the quality assessment. And this is a very important venture to improve the quality of governance in Russia, which is a very important issue. Most Russians don't have much faith in, in government. Um, they don't feel very connected to it. And the academy happily is, and its modernization is taking the lead in that. I became involved in this project through advisory support as a consultant initially with a large team from Mexico and South Africa and Canada and a bunch of countries uh, that was uh, provided by the World Bank. Now, the World Bank provided no money but helped to organize advisory services. So the new program uh, has the World Bank as a strategic partner. But we all also have partnerships with um, um, entities like McKinsey Russia, which is, a, of course, a consulting firm, um, and very much involved in policy issues about infrastructure and economic development. There's some very bright people that are going to be involved in providing uh, some, some teaching for us and some uh, public policy forum. Um, and then we also are reaching out to uh, policy schools in other countries besides Russia that are also very broadly defined, BRICS, BRICS Plus, large emerging economies. And one of the recent developments has been to create a consortium or alliance, which is called IDPPA, the International Development and Public Policy Alliance. And that brings together eight um, policy schools, all teaching at the graduate level, all teaching master's degrees in English, uh, in policy, public policy or global public policy or global development. Uh, and they are in Brazil, Russia, India, China, the four BRICS, plus South Africa, uh, Turkey, uh, Egypt, and Indonesia. So 
put together, that's a majority of the world's population. Uh, there, it's a very significant grouping, and it's countries were, which are in very different ways at a comp, roughly comparable, let's call it, I don't want to be too specific here, but a roughly comparable stage of development. One aspect of which is that they are taking a hard look at the, the, the development process in Europe and the US and have the opportunity not to repeat the mistakes that were made in those countries. So it's a very interesting configuration where we will be sharing faculty, sharing research resources, uh, exchanging students, and it's something that's evolving, mirroring what was done 20 years ago, which I was also involved in, it was called the Global Public Policy Network, which was a construct originally of Columbia, London School of Economics, Sciences Po Paris, then the Lee Kuan Yew School in the National University of Singapore, now also includes members in Brazil, Germany, and Japan. So that's more of a, uh, these terms are, are loathsome in their simplicity, but that was more of a first world developing economies effort. This is more of an emerging economies effort, uh, very broadly defined. Um, so the Russian program will begin next fall. Um, it will have both students and faculty from around the world. It will have three categories of faculty, um, full-time dedicated faculty. We're about to do two or three hires. Uh, and that will be a mixture of Russians and probably an American and a Brit and some others. Second category will be adjunct faculty, people from the Moscow area coming in, mostly Russian but not inevitably, uh, with special expertise to teach a specific course. Uh, NYU does this, Columbia does it. In a, in a global city like, like New York or Washington or Moscow, you have a very rich pool of talented policy professionals. We'll also bring in some people from Russia, um, from uh, the Russian government. We have one guy who's going to teach for us who's just been appointed the uh, director of strategic planning for the Ministry of Economic Development. So this is what every policy school ought to have, which is policy makers in the classroom, you know, once a week, one evening, bringing their experience to the class and talking about how policy is made, not just theoretical level. Um, public policy is inevitably a very practical endeavor. It asks the question, what works? What doesn't work? Why? What works? It also asks a contextual question, what works here? What would work here? And draws context and, and, and examples and best practices from elsewhere. Um, and the third category of faculty will be our visiting professors, who will be from Europe, from the US, from Asia, largely. Uh, people who come in. Um, to teach in an intensive module. Uh, we'll do this mainly with more specialized second year courses rather than core courses. Core courses ought to be ongoing, conventional, we feel, ought to be you know, 14 weeks, once or twice a week, everybody meeting together and evolving a sense of the basic economic skills, the policy and management skills, governance. But when we get to the second year and the, and the concentrations or specializations, and more specific courses, courses like uh, trade and, and, and development, courses uh, in, um, you know, of course, like oil and gas and so forth. We can bring in experts, course by course, find the best people, whether they're in Moscow, whether they're abroad. So we'll bring in visiting faculty. Uh, the visiting faculty, we've already identified some from Paris, from Ottawa, from Washington, will be coming in to teach one course over a 10-day period. Uh, so you can collapse an entire semester into uh, basically a couple of long weekends, three days and three days, if you add the hours up. So those will be our three categories of, uh, of faculty. Students were looking, uh, the, the, the question I love, which I get a lot, is, well, what's the student profile you're looking for? And I say, that's easy, there is no profile. We're looking for a diversity of profiles and people who bring different perspectives, both culturally, nationally, but also different disciplinary perspectives to the table. So we are very much interested in people who might have studied Russia from the cultural and linguistic point of view, Russian language, Russian culture, Russian literature. As Zani mentioned, I'm, I originally have a doctor. My, my real home department was at Columbia was comparative literature, although I did an interdisciplinary doctorate, which also partook of history. Um, and I also taught in the history department. But basically, we're looking for all different kinds of people, not just political scientists or economists. And um, we're looking initially to have a class that would probably be 50% Russian and 50% international, eventually moving more to 
60 or 65 percent international. And the absolute number of students you bring? Uh, the first year cohort will be 30. Uh, notionally, the second year will be 40, and top size when we're at full strength will be 50 each year. Uh, we don't want to get any bigger than that. We think that's an appropriate number for what we're doing. Um, classes will be offered in Moscow, but depending on which concentration you're in. Now we have two concentrations in the second year. The first is called Russia and the World, and it's for those who, who want to focus on, on, on Russia uh, and on the specificity of Russia. And then a second one called Global, uh, global Development uh, uh, or Global Development and Emerging Economies, which will be kind of BRICS plus focus. Both those cohorts at the beginning of the second year will be doing a field-based project, so they'll be traveling. The Russian group will go to one of the Russian regions. The, um, the BRICS group will go to a different country each year, depending on which year you come in. The first project we've already identified, in fact, is going to be China. And so students will go to Beijing and work with my university there uh, on a development-related uh, project. Uh, and then students finish out their curriculum. They choose one concentration, the number of choices of electives within the concentration they can do. And then they do a capstone project, which can be anything they want. It can be a research-based paper. Uh, it can be a, a practical policy project that they'll help arrange with a government agency, uh, even con conceivably with a private uh, player, because the private sector is not a, an insignificant stakeholder in public policy in Russia. Um, many of the uh, both large Russian and international corporations uh, want Russia to become uh, a more robust and balanced economy to get away from the, the so-called resource trap of being dependent on oil and gas revenues and um, to develop a, a service sector and to develop a, a, a different kind of economy that's more balanced and more sustainable. Um, so that um, we anticipate, and public, public policy uh, has always been a field that offers career opportunities across a very broad range. Um, and the, the days, which is where we were in the 50s and 60s, where people went for lifetime careers in the State Department, in a corporation, in a multinational corporation, um, are over. And most of the graduates of policy schools now uh, end up evolving careers in which they move back and forth between the government sector, the private sector, and the non-governmental sector. And those sectors look for certain talents and capabilities that people have nurtured in a sector other than their own and bring them in. Um, to give you an example, um, uh, of course, an I'll start with an obvious one. Uh, government's increasingly looking for people with private sector experience. They have good, strong management and organizational skills, but uh, less intuitive, more counterintuitive, uh, you have um, uh, private sector companies bring in people with NGO experience. Why? Because they're all now developing CSR programs, corporate social responsibility, and are becoming involved in, in social programs and in uh, defining a meaningful role for their, uh, for their corporation in the, the social configuration uh, in which they are located. Um, so the public policy offers um, a, a broader range of, of career choices, and that's one of its attractions. Um, if you look at the more established programs, and that includes Kennedy School and SEPA, and um, indeed program now at, at LSE at Sciences Po, you will find that, um, that those uh, students go on to a very broad range of, of, of options uh, uh, and, and move, move around more. They are more mobile, and they are more, of course, global. They move not only from organization to organization, but from country to country. Um, so it, it offers uh, a, a very different kind of, of career path. Um, the, uh, so the, the program that we're looking at here, and there's a lot more I could say, but I won't because I've spoken for a while, and we would rather open up and ask questions and, and invite comments. Uh, but the program we're, we're crafting uh, is, is looking to create a, a, a cohort of talented students from around the world who will come together in Moscow. Moscow is a very appealing place, actually, to be a student. The cultural uh, and educational resources are formidable. Um, it's a pretty livable city, actually, um, central Moscow, which is where we are, where the, the main campus is about, uh, well, it's exactly 17 minutes by train from Red Square, once you get on the train, <laughs> and a five-minute walk to the, to the subway. Um, and um, 
the, we also have a new executive training center in the downtown area, uh, very near to the, the big cathedral which has been rebuilt, which Stalin destroyed and has now been rebuilt, St. Savior, uh, right in the, in the heart of the city, again, very close to Red Square, uh, where a lot of the classes in this program will be offered. Uh, so the students will move back and forth between the two campuses, uh, which is about a half an hour's ride. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, finish the pitch, as it were. Um, we also have uh, fellowships for students who are, uh, who are admitted and who qualify. They'll be competitive, but they'll be substantial, including some full fellowships. And we will also have, uh, which is a big, big factor in Moscow, which is, tends to be a somewhat expensive city in terms of housing, We'll also have dormitory space that's actually very affordable, uh, cheaper than New York or Washington or the rest of Moscow. Uh, we're looking at $150 to $200 per month for, for dormitory space. So um, it's an attractive proposition for those interested in Russia and Russia in the context of the rapidly globalizing public policy uh, debate and dialogue that's going on. Um, so I'll stop there and invite questions and comments, both at the abstract theoretical level as well as the concrete level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me give you just a very quick one. So if you have 15 <coughs> students coming from abroad, or for the most part, mm -hmm. um, so they would have, they probably have some sort of interest in Russia, you know, some mm -hmm. existing interest. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so they graduate, and where would you expect them to go after that? I mean, if you, I mean, you can't possibly say, you know, the possibilities are endless, but if you had some sense of, you know, some of their career trajectories, Mm -hmm. um, they might apply for jobs like in what sectors and what countries? Well, um, you know, some might go back to their own governments, but with expertise in, say, in, in BRICS economies and the evolution of, of different economic models. Uh, some, and I, something I didn't mention, but it's a very big potential receptor, and again, looking at more established schools, has been as international organizations, everything mm -hmm. World Bank, to IMF, for those with more quantitative skills, but also. Uh, UN agencies and, and other um, you know, international organizations, international NGOs, um, you know, environmental organizations, uh, even some rights-based ones. Uh, there, there are lots of op opportunities there. Cultural <laughs> ones as well. I mean, we, the Russia and the world concentration is meant to be a potential home for students who are interested in, in among other things, but certainly who might be interested in cultural policy, which is actually a very big field in Russia. Um, how you nurture and keep alive cultural institutions and how you, uh, uh, you know, keep people in touch with their cultural heritage and you know, working with museums and cultural organizations across a broad range, not just art museums, but also museums like, I mean, Moscow has some wonderful places like the Sakharov Museum, named after a great dissident. Uh, the, the new museum, which is one of the most spectacular high-tech multimedia museums in the world that I've ever seen, which is the Jewish Museum of Tolerance, which is a very broad-based um, um, and, and very, as I said, very high-tech, very impressive museum about the history of Jews in Russia, but also promoting the broader idea of religious and ethnic tolerance, which is a hot issue in Russia. It's, a, it's an issue that is particularly acute um, in terms of the fact that, as I mentioned, with the changing demography, that a, a city like Moscow is a good example where the, you know, the original residents, the Slavic, largely Slavic residents of Moscow, that population is declining. The number of young people coming into the workforce is declining, and there's going to be a need for immigration. Now, immigration in the U.S. is taken for granted. Immigration in the U.S. has been a driving force behind our development. Um, uh, just to give you a statistic that, 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 that I tell Russians all the time because it's an illustration of how immigration can be a tremendous resource for growth. Um, in the U.S. today, 24% of all bachelor's degrees awarded in science, engineering, are awarded to immigrants to the U.S. 47% of all PhDs awarded to science and engineering, in science and engineering disciplines are given to immigrants to the U.S. So if Russia could move in that direction of nurturing and finding a way to get over the ethnic barriers and the social, let's call them social order barriers that they face, um, they would have other avenues to replenish the workforce and to 
uh, build up cities uh, into the future of global cities is clearly multi-ethnic and, and, and multinational. A lot of the great cities, it's it's and it's it's an issue of coping with that. I mean, the the new incoming, presumably incoming mayor of New York has been talking. Who's my student? He, I know him well. He graduated from SIPA. Um, uh, has been talking about you know New York being two different cities uh, with different cultures and different income levels and. Uh, Moscow faces that, and London faces that, and Paris faces that, where the immigrant population was sequestered and ghettoized in these huge developments outside the center of Paris. It's a global issue. And how you move, because I didn't mention urbanization, which is another global public policy issue. How do you create urban entities that work, that function, that deliver services, but that also have some kind of social and cultural cohesion while at the same time provide not only work in terms of, you know, the buses run, the water flows, the heat comes on, but also that have the kinds of of, uh, of riches that people come to cities for, that have culture and music and art and parks and spaces where people can flourish and, and be nurtured. So these are these are a, a broad complex of issues that students uh, we hope will be able to explore. Um, according to their interest in the program. And with the concomitant careers, I didn't go over all of the careers. I mean, there are... But some of them you think by see this as a pathway to working in Russia, to living in Russia. To working in Russia, yes. And then, and I, I didn't mention, but every policy school in the world has, depending on its its weighting of theory and practice, also has mm, anywhere from 5 to 15% of its graduates going on to doctoral study, going on to become academics and the next generation of teachers. Uh, so that's that's that, that's also uh, the case. Um, uh, Tim Fry, who heads the Harriman Institute, I was just up at Columbia today, and it's the Harriman Institute, which is the Russian Institute at Columbia, was a, initially a public policy student for, in, in SIPA, uh, and then went on to do a PhD and become an academic. So there, there, are, there are broader options. You have to be a little more focused. You have to find your focus in the course of those three years, see where you want to move next. But we... We'll have resources. We'll also uh, have a career services, uh, uh, both a, a, a professional development course as well as a career services office to advise students on what their options might be with coming out of our degree. Are you mostly undergraduates? Mm -hmm. In what? On um, uh, journalism and Russian and Slavic studies. Questions? questions? Yeah. What about um, providing internship opportunities for the incoming students, for the master students? I didn't mention that we will do that, not not in the initial semester because the course load is intense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's something, yes, we're equipped to do and, and intend to do. We, we shied off of making an internship a requirement. And to be honest with you, that might change. You know, we're still evolving this. We're still building a faculty uh, as we become less of a one-man show and more of a, of a faculty <laughs> team. I think we're going to, uh, you know, we're, we're able to rethink. I mean, the curriculum you see in this brochure has already been slightly, not significantly, but slightly altered. We're adding the McKinsey okay. Forum in the second year, uh, the, which is a form of public, global public policy. We're going to move, we're probably going to move a couple of courses around because the consensus is that the research methods course, which Carol Leonard is going to teach, mm -hmm. ought to be earlier, and we're probably going to move public management back to the second semester. So there'll be slight tweaking, and uh, we hope uh, making a bit finer and more precise the curriculum. But uh, inter an internship will be an integral part of that, though may maybe or maybe not actually required, but certainly available as an opportunity. And the, the academy itself and its faculty have um, terrific resources in terms of, of that, as well as strong ties to the private sector. Again, so private sector internships, we've already talked with a number of companies that are ready and willing to take interns, as well as NGOs, cultural organizations. Um, I'm just curious where, um, if you could kind of specify there's a demand for Americans in public policy or cultural policy now in Russia for students that would graduate from this and wanted to stay in Russia? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think that um, 
the, the key thing is not being America. It's being a public, a trained public policy analyst, mm -hmm. someone that comes out of the program. I mean, people who come out of these programs, to some extent, these global policy programs, <laughs> are identified by their skills rather than by their nationality. So it's, you, you wouldn't begin by describing yourself as an American mm -hmm. who's doing public policy. You're a public policy analyst with the following skills. And yes, you were born in America, and yes, you did your first degree at NYU, and then you came and went to Russia and did it there. I think that's, that's what's more important. Um, that said, there are, again, possibilities in the private sector with multinational corporations who have very, and consulting firms that have a very strong presence in Russia and where you do find Americans and Europeans and others. Um, there are a smaller number of NGOs. The NGO sector has been under assault in some ways by recent government actions, but actually there are signs that they're easing off of that. And that, I mean, basically it was a register, as you probably know, it was a law about registering. You had to register, if you received a certain amount of your money from abroad, you had to register as a foreign agent. And basically, with almost no exceptions that I know of, all the NGOs stood up and said, we're not foreign agents and we're not gonna register as foreign agents. So the government is kind of scratching its head and not really uh, you know, except for a few highly publicized raids at the beginning of last year is, is backing off of that because it was silly. Um, so there are NGO options. Uh, and then um, and then also in, in the universities, there are jobs there, uh, you know, in, in higher education. More and more, people, more and more of the Russian universities are looking for young foreign foreigners who are well-trained, well-educated. So we have, we have on the academic, uh, management staff of the university, a significant number of recent graduates, uh, some public policy, some not, some in other areas, but who are particularly Americans, but also British and Europeans as well. So that's a broad range, and I think, again, I have not covered everything that would be an option to work in Russia. The number of jobs available for foreigners working in Russia is expanding, not contracting. Um, it's really a, an opening up that's quite significant. I mean, I should tell you that Hiring someone like me was impossible two years ago. They had to. They changed the law. Um, they um, they opened up a new category for visas, uh, a new pathway uh, for hiring that that's very new. So that last year, or it's not, it's not even last year. It's early, earlier this year in January, when I was being hired under this new category. The people in my university kept calling up the various government agencies and ministries and saying, this form asked for this, we don't know how to do this, and the, the ministries often answered, we're doing this for the first time too, we don't know how to answer that either. <laughs> so it was a process being gone through for the first time, but it all happened. And I'm, I'm actually now, an, I'm an American citizen, but I'm an employee of the Russian Federation, I have a Russian tax number, I'm paid in rubles, I'm, I have a long-term visa. Uh, and I work for a Russian institution, and my loyalty is to that, in fact, to that institution and building up its program, not to representing an American point of view. So that's another answer to your question, is that people are professionals in global public policy are assuming kind of a global identity. They bring with them a cultural tradition, a heritage, and, you know, my Americanness is still distinct and, and you know, leads me to think of some things in some ways, but those ways are changing. It's, America's role changing. Um, I guess I have more of like an abstract theoretical question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned previously that Russians have a hard time like connecting personally with the government. They have a general distrust of the government, which mm -hmm. I think is something we can all agree with. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if having kind of like an elite institution that trains public officials would actually help to alleviate that problem, or if it would actually worsen it, because I feel like that makes it seem so like separate from like the reality of Russian life? It's a very good that question. It's a very... It um, actually work against itself. Sure. No, that's a question that should be asked. And, and certainly there are Russians and others who would say that's a problem, the, the role of an elite institution, of the looking at the history of elite institutions in Russia. However, the, the orientation of our institution is such that it is very conscious of trying to... Um, rebalance some of the things that have gotten very much out of balance in the Russian society. I'll give you an example. Um, as you know, and, and this is not a uniquely Russian problem, but it's very acute in particular in Russia, 
is the imbalance in resources and talent between Moscow and the rest of Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Moscow has a disproportionate amount of the money, the income, the major institutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera the middle class, and so forth. The academy, uh, for the last two summers, has run uh, a very uh, competitive uh, leadership program for young Russian university students, generally second and third year students, called the Summer Campus. And it's actually held in, outside of Kazan, with support from the Republic of Tatarstan, which is one of the wealthier members of the Russian Federation, uh, and whose president went to Renepa, so he, he's on board. And this is 300 students that come for three weeks for uh, lectures in everything, public policy, leadership, uh, management, thinking about their careers. It's very broad-based, very exciting, very, very interactive. 4,500 students applied, 300 were accepted. They had to write an essay, they had to pass an oral English test, so it was very competitive. And there were 300 of them, so I said to the organizers, I said, well, I assume a significant proportion, what, half, 60% of these come from Moscow. They said, no, 300 kids, five from Moscow, just five. So that's a mindset that says <laughs> Russia has great untapped resources outside of Moscow and begins to, begins to need to reach out to those resources and to that human capital. Um, another example is something that the academy in Rostov did. Um, now, part of people feeling alienated from government has been, and again, not uniquely Russian, but the Russian form it's taken, is the inability of the government at all levels often to deliver efficiently services and, and to be accessible to, to citizens' needs. Um, in Rostov, in the lobby of the academy, in downtown Rostov, they've created a citizen service center for public services. And citizens can go in, and there are desks for the water, the electricity, the, the various public services, health and so forth. And there are nice, articulate young people, you know, well-dressed, very polite, very receptive to hear complaints, to handle difficulties. You can pay your bills there. Uh, so this is trying to make government more accessible, more open. There's also, now he knows this, there's also, and there's a tortured history to it, but the, the upshot is quite positive. There's also, in Russia now, a minister, cabinet level minister of open government, whose mandate is to make the Russian government more accessible and transparent. And I know some people actually who come out of the academy who are working on the, the, the planning and design side of this, of uh, refashioning Russian governmental institutions to make them more open and more accessible to citizens. So, the, you know, the, the, the thing to keep in mind, you, you all are connected to Russia in different ways. We were talking about this at Columbia earlier. The thing to keep in mind is this, you know, even when you know something about Russia, when you've been there and you understand something about the culture and its history and how they've gotten from where they've come to where they are, despite all that, when you still look at the media, you've got this weary old narrative, particularly in the US, of which is a Cold War narrative, and it's still, it still can't be killed. It's like the vampire, you can't get the stake into its heart. Of Putin is the, Putin is the new czar, he's the new Stalin. Everything that happens in Russia comes across Stalin, uh, but Putin's desk, and Putin decides everything, and everything that happens in Russia happens because Putin decides it happens. Well, it's not true, of course. Russia is, a constitutional democracy, albeit a struggling and emergent one. And that means that there are different groups, interest groups in Russia, all the way from the ones that the US media likes to write about, which are the Siloviki, these old buddies from the security services. But there are also, there's also the business community, and there's also uh, the military, and there's also the reformers, and, and people who, and the, and the, if you will, the public management types who want to reform government. And all of those, have a say, and in fact Putin and the people who run the Russian government listen to all those groups. They don't always listen to them equally. They sometimes decide that they'll ignore what this group said and pick what this group said. Um, so public policy decisions like uh, some bad ones, for instance, the, the decree about uh, gay and lesbian propaganda, which was pandering to a certain group, church in particular, 
Uh, they make bad decisions, but sometimes they make good decisions too and listen to more progressive voices. But aside from all that, beneath the surface, at the functional level, there's some very exciting, innovative things going on in governance in Russia, um, in trying to modernize and normalize the way government functions. Um, and there are all kinds of things. And there are things going on in the cities. There's a, a movement, for instance, called De La Isan, Do It Yourself, which is a, a, it sprang up organically. It's an organic movement. And we actually had a paper at our global policy conference in Beijing from, I mean, this is global public policy in action, from a woman born in Nigeria, but who's a doctoral student at CUNY, lives in New York, comes from a design background, but then went to Russia for nine months and did uh, a, a program at the Strelka Institute, which is this wonderfully creative urban living institute in, in, in Moscow. And she did a study of this do-it-yourself movement in Russian neighborhoods, in neighborhoods around Moscow, uh, which is people uh, attempting to take things out of the, not take things out of the hands of the government so much as to circumvent the government and improve the physical environment that they live in. So that those of you who've been to Russia know you have these huge streets and to cross them you go to the Perekhod, which is the, it's an underground passageway. Often very grim, very dirty. Well, they, in certain neighborhoods they've taken these over, they've cleaned them up and they've put up artwork or they've put up music. So, you know, ways of people taking charge of their own destiny, of their own identity, uh, is, is a new theme in Russia, and it's something that's that's rather new and not. It, it's very homegrown, but it hasn't been something that has had an avenue of expression up until now. So uh, there are lots of dimensions of of of, of, of this self empowerment going on, and the academy. Some parts of the academy have helped to foster that in terms of improving. That is a very long answer to a very simple question. Improving the relationship between government and its citizens. I can't resist this one. It's okay. Really, and it's unfair, probably, but... Um, Those are the good questions. <laughs> you know, we, have a, we have a very strong LGBT movement at the university, as we mm -hmm. all over New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people who might want to apply, and they want to know how to promote, uh, through government policy and through public administration, um, rights or interests of um, LGBT communities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. would this be a program for them? It might be. Mm -hmm. It might be. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the incendiary nature of the issue in Russia is certainly fading. Um, it was, I think as a policy decision, it was made not only hastily but carelessly and for, you know, crass political re reasons. Uh, nobody thought very much about its implications and nobody saw coming the international reaction against it. Um, I think there are many who wish they could get rid of it. It is complicated their leadership in the Olympics. Um, and clearly the, the, the kind of what, what we call the church anti-gay elements in Russia who uh, hap you know, uh, were, were happy to think that this meant that it would be enforced at the Olympics and that people would be you know, knocked over the head and carried away should they express themselves that way or clearly disappointed. And Putin has, I think, quietly rather than publicly told them to you know, sit tight and keep their mouths shut. So now, I know many gay people in Moscow, um, and I think that they, they're kind of startled by the whole thing. They find it um, a, a bit surprising, um, in a good way, in the sense that the international community has reached out to them. But um, what they tell me about the texture of their life, now again, Russia inside, uh, first of all, Moscow inside the Garden Ring is a privileged place, and, and certainly some of them live there, central Moscow, where they live lives not very different from gay people here and in other Western countries where there are rights more, or more laws protecting them. Um, but And clearly elsewhere it's an issue. But I, I think you're going to see this law uh, change somewhere, quietly change in, somewhere in the next few years. And there are various organizations. I mean, clearly street protests, the, you know, it's kind of street theater. Um, is, is in the Russian context not terribly effective. Um, it's a good way of publicizing the message, but it's probably not the way policy gets changed. I think it's going to happen in a quieter context, and I know there are many gay Russians who want to change the policy and are thinking about 
other ways to do it than the street theater. Common sense behind closed doors. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. But there is, you know, but the, 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 the image that all Russian gays cower behind locked doors and, and, and lead their lives in secret is not true. Well, look, thanks for doing this. Um, do spread the word. Um, I think this is a good program to think of. Um, seriously. And um, our, Please look at our website, which tells you a lot more than I can tell you in 25 minutes. Um, uh, there's also uh, an email address, and I'm happy to personally interact with you, answer any questions you might have if you're interested in the program. Or anything. This is key. Yeah. Write them in. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Robin. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, you guys. And um, is your son here? That's my son. Yeah. Oh, hello. Mm -hmm. Nice to see you too. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can come again. Thank you very come much. Come again. Yeah. And next time we'll mobilize the comrades better. You know, okay, and, well, yeah. comrades take some mobilizing everywhere, and New yeah. York is one of those cities where people are going in a million different directions. Oh, it's just a matter of finding the right group. Yeah. Um, we're new at this, we'll figure it out. Very right. good, very good. No, we'll Thanks. be back. Okay. And we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from you if you're interested or your friends. And, uh, if not now, in the future, we're, we'll be there. Thanks I again. Have one day in mind for Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, why don't you hold on to these? I will. So, so that they're keeping them under the fire. Oh. Um, you know, you may know the name of the